Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Ying Shua Ua about micro and nanoplastic movement through the soil. Microplastics can come from all kinds of sources, including broken down bottles, face and body scrubs, plastic bags, tire tracks, agricultural mulch films, sewage waste, and more. However, for as ubiquitous as these plastics can be, there's still much to be learned about how they move through our soils, how they're affected by their surrounding soils, weather, and animals, and their ultimate environmental impacts. This episode, Ying Shua shares research from her recent review paper about what microplastic knowledge we already have and where we have yet to go. Make sure to stick around to the end of our show for our brand new student spotlight segment as well. We'll talk more about all that in a minute, but before we dive in, we wanted to thank our sponsors, starting with Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. Our second sponsor is Gazmet Technologies, the maker of the GT5000 Terra, the smallest portable FTIR multi-gas analyzer for greenhouse gas and environmental research. Measure carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ammonia, and water vapor in real time simultaneously from static or automated chambers and ruminant emissions. Visit www.gazmet.com, that's gazmet spelled G-A-S-M-E-T, or email sales at gazmet.com for more information. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Today we have Ying Shua Wu with us today. Ying Shua is currently a PhD candidate in soil science at Washington State University. She studies micro and nanoplastic pollution in the terrestrial environment, specifically looking at how micro and nanoplastics move in the soil, how micro and nanoplastics interact with soil, and how these processes would impact soil. She came from China and studied her PhD in 2018. Before that, she did her bachelor's and master's in hydrogeology. Hi, Ying Shua. How are you doing today? I'm feeling pretty good. How about you? I am doing super well. So happy to have you on the show. So today we are talking about micro and nanoplastics moving through the soil. So before we get started, I wanted to just identify a few key terms that we'll be using throughout the show and give you the opportunity to define those for our listeners so to get started, can you define the Vedo zone? Of course. So the Vedo zone is the terrestrial subsurface that extends from the surface of the soil to the groundwater table. Okay. And then bioturbation? Bioturbation is the disturbance of soil caused by either plants or animals. I'll give you one example. We know that there are a lot of earthworms living in the soil, right? And then these earthworms would dig some burrows in soil. They would hide in these burrows, and then they would come out to find foods, like plant debris or some dirt. If they find these plant debris, they would drag these debris back into the burrows, redistributing where these plant debris would normally distribute in soil. It's a disturbance to the soil. That's the bioturbation. Okay. And then uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Okay. Hydrophilic and hydrophobic are describing whether a material can be wetted by water. Hydrophilic would be a material that can be easily wetted by water, such as cotton or wood. If you spray some water on them, the water would just spread out. But hydrophobic materials are these repellent to water, such as lotus leaves or waterproofed clothes. For example, for the waterproofed clothes, if there are some water sprayed onto them, the water, instead of spreading themselves out, they would form some droplets, and then the droplets would roll off the waterproof clothes. That's how we get waterproof clothes. 
So that makes sense? Yes. All right. So that makes a lot of sense. We've got some of those key terms identified. So moving on, I want to talk about uh, microplastics and nanoplastics at large. So uh, both just defining, you know, how how micro is micro <laughs> in this instance, um, as well as nano, and kind of just the general scope of this problem that we're facing with all of these in the environment, uh, the scale of this problem, where they are, how often they're around, anything like that. So can you just give us an overview of microplastics in the environment in general? Yeah, of course. I'd like to start with some typical examples of plastic pollution. When you drive on the road, if you pay attention, you would find some discarded plastic waste on the roadside, right? That's quite common. So actually, plastic pollution has already become a prominent topic in both scientific and public discussions. We see a lot of pictures of plastic littered beaches, plastic floating on the surface of the ocean, plastic find in the intestines of seabirds and fish. Other than these visible and large-scale plastic pollution, there is also a pervasive threat from all these tiny plastic pieces, which are called micro and nano plastics. Micro plastics are defined as plastic particles with size between 100 nanometer to 5 millimeter. Nano plastics are defined as plastic pieces with size less than 100 nanometer. Because of their small size, these micro and nano plastics can be easily taken up by animals, which would cause some indirect harm by competing for intestinal space or impeding food uptake. These micro nanoplastics can also cause direct toxic effect on tissues when they are inhaled or ingested by animals. That's the problem we are facing and also when these micro nanoplastics enter soil, they would interact with soil matrix, which eventually may change the soil's physical, chemical, or biological properties. And then, in, as, a, as a consequence of that, the changes in soil properties may disturb animals living in the soil or plants living in the soil. Sure, sure. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of the general problem is they scatter all over the place and get in places they shouldn't, I guess. Uh, You explained it way better than I did. Uh, So the next thing I want to talk about is kind of the different types of uh, these particles that you find. I was really interested to realize that they could be categorized in different ways. Um, So there's kind of two different ways to categorize these plastics. And the first is between uh, primary and secondary micro and nanoplastics. Can you explain the difference between those two categories? Yeah, of course. So based on their origin of these micro and nanoplastics, they can be categorized into primary and secondary micro and nanoplastics. Primary are those that are intentionally manufactured to be small. One typical example is the plastic beads used as abrasive in personal care products like toothpaste, but now they are phased out because there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of whether these plastic beads would cause some negative impacts to our human beings. Secondary micro nanoplastics are quite common in nature because we all have the experience like if we leave some plastic robes outdoors for too long and after a while if we go to grab them, they become so brittle and then they would break down into tiny pieces. These tiny plastic pieces are called secondary micro nanoplastics. They are generated during the breakdown of larger plastic pieces. Okay. And then the other way to describe them is kind of by their physical shape or form. And there's three categories for those. So can you describe those categories? 
Yeah, of course. Generally, we categorize them based on their shape, like granules, fibers, or films. Granules are plastic beads used in personal products. Fibers would be these lint shedding off from our sweaters, like if the sweaters are made of polyester, they shed off this lint. Then there are some films that are breakdown products of agriculture, mulch films, and also like grocery bags, they could also break down into tiny film pieces. Okay, and it, what is a film piece shape like? Is it, I mean, is it like a tiny, tiny piece of paper? Is it, you know, just a crumbled up ball or an irregular shape? What does that look like? It would be quite similar to a piece of paper, just in much smaller scale. It okay. would mean the thickness of that plastic piece is much smaller than other dimensions. Okay. Um, yeah, that all makes sense to me. So we've kind of defined what they are, how you can describe them in general high-level categories. So I'd like to move into one of the areas that you covered in your review paper, which was uh, how they move or, or how the way that they move is affected by water. So can you tell me about that? Yeah, sure. So the movement of these micro nanoplastics in soil is affected by water. Water is a key component to control their movement. We can think water as the car we drive every day. The cars take us to different destinations depend on the road as well. And the road would be the soil particles themselves. Sometimes we drive on highway, the speed would be much higher and then we can be carried to a longer distance in a shorter time. That would be quite similar when the flow rate, water flow rate is higher. So the micro nanoplastics would be carried away for longer distance in a shorter time. And sometimes the road condition also matters. If the road is too bumpy, we get slowed down or even get stuck. That would happen to micro nanoplastics too when the soil particle surface is rough. That could stick some micro nanoplastics there instead of having the water moving them. The soil particle itself would stick these micro nanoplastics there just like even we have a good car, we can't move that far when the road condition is bad. That's how water affects the movement of micro nanoplastics in soil. Okay, so different soil types would be like different road conditions. So a sand is going to be different than a loam and that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. I'm glad you bring that up, actually. Yeah, so it's like um, the different textured soil would have different pore sizes. Like the sand would have a larger pore size. That would mean we are driving on a path with much wider space. But if the particles are moving in silt loam, the pore sizes would be much smaller than we are driving in a narrow path, and then we can get easily stuck. Same thing for the micro nanoplastics. Okay, so is that similar to how many, I guess, lanes of traffic you have on a road? Would that be a good way to describe that? Yeah, that makes sense too. It would be uh, quite similar to the pore size. Of course, like how many lanes you have, it's similar to how, how much space you have in the soil. Okay, so now that we have water transport uh, kind of under our belts, I wanted to talk about the bioturbation aspect of this. So how does that affect the way that these particles move through the soil? As I mentioned before, bioturbation is a disturbance caused by plants and animals. We take the earthworms as an example. Earthworms would come out from their burrows, find some plant debris, 
take them back into the burrow, redistribute the locations of these pandebrates. Same thing happened to micro nanoplastics. When earthworms eat up these micro nanoplastics, they would defecate and then micro nanoplastics would end up in their cast. And these casts would be in the soil instead of on the soil surface. That's how earthworms or other animals redistribute the micro nanoplastics in soil. Okay. Um, I know this wasn't covered in your review, so maybe this is not a question that we have an answer to yet. But is there any evidence as far as like plant bioturbation? I know that that's like another category. Have has any research been done on that kind of thing, or or what do we know <laughs> if we do know anything? That's a really good question. There are some research going on to look whether plant roots can take up some micro nanoplastics. So far, there are a few studies have shown that plant roots can actually take up these micro nanoplastics and then relocate them into their into the plant shoots and leaves. That's a, also a type of redistribution of micro nanoplastics from the soil environment to the plant itself. And also some studies also find micro nanoplastics can stick onto the root surface. We know that plant roots penetrate the soil deeper and deeper. So if micro nanoplastics they stick onto the plant root surface over time, the plant roots get deeper and deeper. These micro nanoplastics would also move along with the plant roots and then move into the deeper layer of the soil. Yeah, and then I would guess, you know, if there's animals that eat the roots, then they could potentially get the nanoparticles in themselves from that. As far as plants uptaking plastic, do we know what that does to them? Like, is it just kind of similar to an animal where it's like, oh, now I can't take up this other thing because that space is already taken? Does it wind up in the in the crop that we harvest? Do we know anything about that or are we still like early stages? I think we are still on the earlier stages because all these experiments are done in highly controlled environment where like they don't use actual soil. Instead, they use some agar. So we don't know yet. I guess potentially it would just be accumulation of micro nanoplastics in our food chain if plants really take up all these micro nanoplastics from soil but so far we don't have conclusive evidence yet hi everyone i hope you're enjoying the show interested in learning more Ying Shu's paper, Current Understanding of Subsurface Transport of Micro and Nanoplastics in Soil, published in Vedosone Journal, is always freely available. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thanks again also to our sponsors, Gazman Technologies and Meter Group. For Gazman Technologies, the GT5000 Terra is a robust and portable multi-gas analyzer for field work weighing 20.7 pounds. The GT5000 Terra is splash-proof IP54 rated with an internal pump and battery and instantaneous readings of up to 50 gases at sub-PPM concentrations. Check out the quick setup guide and learn more about Gazmat Technologies at www.gazmat.com and the links in the show notes. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. 
Sure. Yeah, I imagine there's a lot of research that that could be done in that area. That's super fascinating. Yeah. Um, and and probably wise not to just throw a bunch of plastic out into a field and test it in the field right away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the next item on our list, which I know is one that you're really interested, in, is uh, the impact of weathering. And I know this could be you know, both how weather itself, be that rain or wind, could impact how they travel, but also how weathering on the plastic itself uh, can change the way that the particle, uh, like its chemical makeup or shape and things like that. So can you talk to us about that? Yeah, sure. I think weathering is a process that will ultimately happen to all the micro nanoplastics in our environment. All these micro nanoplastics are exposed to sunlight, air, heat, moisture. All these conditions would degrade the polymer over time. Once these polymers are degrading, they would have some changes in their physical properties, like they would become discolored, they would become smaller, and then they would become brittle. The, all these changes, of course, would affect how these micro nanoplastics interact with the environment. Taking one example, if the micro nanoplastics become smaller and smaller over time, meaning that they would be much easier to access so many tiny spaces and they would be more difficult to find for us and then that would change how they interact with the environment and how we would detect them and how we would predict their impacts. Sure. Um, and then I know you had talked in the review paper about how... Um, Part of weathering and being exposed to these different things could also mean um, getting bonded to other types of particles, be those toxins or different kinds, getting a coating of dirt on them, things like that. Can you talk about that aspect of things? Yeah, sure. Because weathering changes the property of these micro nanoplastics, like we talked before, the hydro. If obesity of the plastics would change over time. Normally, plastics are hydrophobic by nature, and then the weathering would render them into hydrophilic, and then instead of bonding some hydrophobic materials on their surface, over time, micro nanoplastics would bond some hydrophilic materials, and also the surface charge of these micro nanoplastics would also change because the function groups on the surface would change over time and then changes the way how these micro nanoplastics interact with organic matter or some proteins in the soil. Once these micro nanoplastics are coated with different materials, they would interact with the environment through these coating instead of through their own surface. And the whole process is also modified by the environmental weathering. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I, I actually wanted to jump back a little bit. I forgot to ask you this earlier, and I think it's interesting. I wanted to talk about the fibers specifically. Um, and what you found for how they interacted differently. Um, and I guess in general, you could expand that to how primary and secondary versus granules, fibers, film. Like, what are the differences that you found in within these kinds of interactions, like the water transport or bioturbation? Yeah, so fibers are quite unique because they have the, they have one dimension now, so long, the other dimension so small, and they would easily entangle in the soil matrix, making them less likely to move through the soil, unlike the granules, which has the same size across all the dimensions. And also, fibers are quite flappy, if you think about them. 
we have seen that with a little amount of fiber, the soil can also can already change in volume quite a bit compared to if you add some granules into the soil. That's how they are different, just because of their shape. Sure. I imagine it's kind of like if you're pouring something down a drain, which would be, you know, your pour or, or whatever. I'm, I'm never good with the terminology, so please <laughs> just bear with me. You know, if you if you have, you know, hair that goes down a drain or spaghetti noodles, if you want a less gross analogy, <laughs> you know, those are going to get tangled and entangle other things more easily than if you're throwing a bunch of blueberries or seeds or something down the drain, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. That all makes sense. Uh, Sorry to jump us around a little bit. I wanted to, uh, since we've already covered the results, I wanted to jump ahead then to future research. And I know there's a lot lot of different areas in this. We've already talked about some of them. But there were two in particular that you wanted to talk about today. Can you tell me about those areas? Yeah, sure. So in the future, I first want to look at how micro nanoplastics affect soil hydraulic properties. Soil hydraulic properties are the relationship between water and soil in terms of how fast water can move through soil, how soil is binding with water. We can think soil as a sponge. It can suck a lot of water. If we squeeze the sponge, some water would come out, but the sponge itself can still be wet. And then if we sprinkle a lot of of water on the top of the sponge, the water would naturally drain out from the sponge. I want to see how adding micro and nanoplastics would affect water in that sponge or in the soil. Another aspect I want to look at is to look some environmentally relevant micro nanoplastics because environmentally relevant micro nanoplastics are these that can be easily found in our environment. These micro nanoplastics have been already subjected to all kinds of natural processes like weathering we mentioned before and also the interaction with other materials in the environment, like the coating with proteins or organic matters or soil minerals, these micro nanoplastics would already have changed their surface properties. In other words, they would interact with the environment through all these changed surface properties, and then we still don't know a lot about these, so I want to look at more into environmentally relevant micro nanoplastics. Okay. I have a couple questions off of that. So you mentioned earlier that a lot of these research experiments so far have been very much lab-based. So I know in your paper you talked about people using, you know, the primary granule beads to see how that will work within a like a tube of a whatever soil type they're working with or you mentioned the agar for the plant stuff so my question is how does then that transfer into the field i mean obviously people aren't like let's dump a bunch of plastic into a bunch of soil um but those do naturally exist there not well not supernaturally i guess um but now they do just exist in the environment so how do you find and identify plastics especially if they are so so small and covered with other things um as that you know outer coating how does one yeah i guess how do you go about researching these and finding the relevant plastics and how do you know that they're there or not things like that can you talk about that yeah sure Actually, we already know there are a lot of inputs of micro nanoplastics to our environment, like biosolids is a typical one. We can separate these micro nanoplastics from the soil samples by mm, density separation because we know that these particles are lighter in terms of density compared to soil particles. We could just 
suspend a whole bunch of soil samples in water, and then plastics would float on the surface, we can harvest all these environmentally relevant micro nanoplastics from the environment. And also, another way we can create some environmentally relevant micro nanoplastics by simulating the natural processes in our lab. We know that micro nanoplastics are exposed to UV light and moisture. We can do all these artificial measuring in the artificial measuring chamber. That's how we get all the environmentally relevant micro nanoplastics. Okay. So just as an example, you might take a soil sample that you know is you know, pure or free of samples and compare that to uh, just a soil sample you got from your field site and then do your tests on the hydraulic properties or whatever and then kind of filter out the plastics after that to see, you know, what was actually there that was causing the changes. Is that kind of a, a decent example? I guess we can do that. I've never done that. <laughs> yeah. What I have done so far is to generate all these weather micro nanoplastics and then spike the soil with all these plastics. I guess your way is the other way around, like look into how the actual field is affected by all these micro nanoplastics. Okay. All right. I was I was kind of close. So I feel yeah. good about that. Um not not a scientist if anyone had any question in their mind by this point of the episode. Um okay, so that's really interesting. I'm always curious how experiments are done. So thank you for your grace in my rabbit trails today. Um so I've got three questions left for you today. So the first question is if people want to learn more about this topic or any of the research we talked about today, uh, other than your paper, which we'll obviously have a show note link, where can they go for more information? Yeah, there are a few organizations that I follow. The first one is National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and also National Geographic Society. There you can find a lot of information about plastic pollution as well as how micro and nanoplastics are actually affecting our society. Okay. Yep. And then if people then want to take the next step and get involved with this research, how can they do that? Yeah, I guess they can start ways by reducing plastic waste. We already know that plastic pollution is a big problem. And it's mainly caused by inappropriate management of plastic waste. Our society is not capable to deal with all of these plastic waste we generate in our daily lives. So as individuals, we can start from ourselves by reducing plastic waste with replacing single-use plastic products with reusable ones and sorting all our plastic waste according to the guidelines. Sure, sure. That's great advice. And then last question is, what is one fun fact that people would not know about you if all they had was your research? (laughs) I love the Big Bang Theory so much, so I have watched it for seven times so far. Wow, that is a a big fan. (laughs) Do Do you have a favorite character? Yeah, I love Sheldon the most. Classic answer. (laughs) Yeah. Good choice. Good choice. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate the research that you're doing, and it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to talk with you, too. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to the end for our brand new student spotlight. In each spotlight, we highlight one student, including who they are, where they are now, and where they hope to go. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our brand new student spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Fernanda. Fernanda, welcome to the show. Can you start us off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you, Webby, for the opportunity to be here today and be part of the grad student highlight of Field Lab Earth podcast. 
I am Fernanda Krupak, a second year PhD student and member of the Resilient Cropping Systems Lab, which is led by my advisor, Dr. Andrea Beige, in the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Wonderful. And what are you currently researching? So my doctoral dissertation centers on the Soil Health Initiative and through on-farm experiments, which are trials conducted at producer's field, we have been researching cover crops and diversified crop rotations. And one of the questions currently addressed in my PhD is how integrative measures can define the current status of land quality and its change over time. So for example, we are looking at changes in soil water, infiltration rates, and carbon and nitrogen store within soil organic matter. So it is a little bit different from a traditional PhD project because in fact, the farmers are also the researchers, right? They are testing soil health promoting practices in their field. And we, the university, are quantifying soil and crop changes in their fields. So I would say the implementation of this conservation-oriented project encompasses all aspects of land-grant uh, university mission, which is research, extension, and education. Wonderful. And if you could have your dream research project, what would that be? Wow, that's a, a great question. I've tried to center my research efforts so far uh, to promote equitable, healthy, and profitable and resilient food systems. So a dream a research project would be to investigate the potential of existing farming systems to undergo sustainable intensification. So this involves a shift from external input technologies, for example, fertilizer, herbicides, and pesticides, towards more ecologically based systems that rely more on the usage of internal ecosystem process to supply water and nutrients and also control pests. So I would say two broad goals for this project would be to understand resource use efficiency, in particular nutrient cycling and water dynamics of more intensified cropping systems, and also understand how these intensified cropping systems bounce back from disturbance such as increased flood and drought events. So finally, I would say that a dream research project would be one that allowed me to continue my engagement, not only in research, but also in extension and education. Wonderful. That sounds like a great project. If you'd like to get in touch with Fernanda about her work, we'll have her contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you.